Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. How is everyone? On behalf of the youth class, we would like to thank you all for coming out and worshiping with us in the house of the Lord. I'm thankful to be sharing the platform today with the classmates and close friends witnessing for the Lord. The teen class felt that we should be doing more in the church and in our communities. So my friends and I began to think about us and the, us youth in the last days and what we should be doing. So with the help of the Sabbath school teachers and parents and pastor, we began putting our thoughts together on how the youth can be engaging and participating in the ministry of the last days. If you would uh, like to, if you would like to uh, turn your Bibles with me to uh, Proverbs twenty-two six. Proverbs twenty-two six. Say Amen when you got it. And it reads, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he gets old, he shall not depart from it. I am thankful for the Lord and church family for the training I have received. I have been trained in the way of the Lord. I have been in God's word. I have been taught to know God's will. The foundation of his foundation has been laid. Now the choice is mine and yours. I promise it will take a lot to depart from this. Above all, I am thankful that that this training continues, and I will continue to I'll continue to make me a strong soldier in God's army. Amen. I would like to read a quote from a book called Messages to Young People, page two nineteen, and it reads, "The Lord calls for young men and women to gird themselves." for a lifelong earnest labor in the Sabbath school work. The Lord would have teachers in the Sabbath school work who can give wholehearted services, who will increase their talents by exercise and make improvement on what has already been attained. In Christ's object, in Christ's object lessons, he further says, each has, been, each has his place in the eternal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in heaven and heavenly mansions than is special place designed on earth where we are to work for God. So we are to work for God and each, each youth can find opportunities to be helpful here on earth. So is every adult in here. Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character will be an easy matter. A noble all-round character is not inherited, nor does it come by accident. A noble, is, a noble character is earned by hard, earnest work, individual effort through the merits and grace of the, of the mind against heredity tendencies. We shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not not even one unflavored trait to remain in us or uncorrected. God wants the youth to become men and women of earnest mind, to prepare for action in his noble work and fitted to bear responsibilities. Amen. The spirit of prophecy tells us that God calls for young men and women with uncorrupt hearts, strong and brave, determined to fight manfully in the struggle before them, that they may glorify God and bless humanity. If the youth would but make the Bible their study, would but calm their impetuous desires and listen to the voice of the Creator and the Redeemer, they would not only be, they would not only be at peace with God, but would find themselves ennobled and elated. Friends, it will be for the internal interest to give heed to the instructions and the word of God, for it is treasure to each and every one, young or old. 
I encourage everyone to lead a life that is spirit-filled or led, because then it's not us living through these physical bodies, but Christ himself living through us. We are simply emulated his character, or emulating his character. People see him through us. Self dies and he takes over. Only then his ministry effects around us and wherever we go. Why church? Why young people? Because it is Christ living through us. The words we speak are not ours, but his. The thoughts we think are not ours, but his. They are pure thoughts, wholesome thoughts. Do you wish to, t- do you wish to be a part of this, friends? Amen. The youth are being called and charged to be part of God's work as it moves forward, friends. Let us facilitate and equip them to be part of the great work or ministry in the last days. They have been an important role to play, just like we find a lot of of youth in the Bible who witness for the for the Lord. In Gospel Workers, page sixty-seven, Ellen White says, "God has chosen chosen the young to advocate or to aid in the advancement of His cause, to plan with clear mind and execute with courageous hand demands fresh." Uncrippled energies. Young people are invited to give God the strength of their of their youth. That through the exercise of their powers, through keen thoughts of vigorous action, they may bring glory to Him and salvation to their fellow men. If you would turn in your Bibles with me to Ecclesiastes twelve one through three. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 3. Please say amen when you got it. Do not let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, Life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light of the sun, moon and stars is dim, or old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken the sky. Remember him before your legs, the guard of your house, start to tremble, and before your shoulders, the the strong men stop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants. Stop grinding in before your eyes, men and women. Look through the windows, see dimly. We all have our work to do. Let us remember our duties while there is time and when we are still able to. God will bless our efforts and and, and devours. But put emphasis here. Now here is the conclusion of, of the whole matter, friends. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is a whole duty of man. May God bless you all. Today I'd like to talk to you about what you should do now and in end times. Today's youth have a big responsibility with carrying God's work forward and to help this world come out of the darkness. We are the future leaders of tomorrow. We carry the light and truth of God. I'd like you to turn with me in 1 Timothy 4.12. 1 Timothy 4.12. And give me an amen when you've got it. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Also, please turn it with me to Matthew 5.14. And please tell me, please tell me, please give me an amen when you get there. Amen. 
Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Why? Because we have the light and we are obligated to share it with other people on this planet. We witness the people in many different ways. The light that we have dispels the darkness of the world. The truth that we have overcomes the darkness or the lack of knowledge about God people may have. My youth class has gone to some hospitals like in the ones like at Hughley Hospital to sing to the sick. We saw some broken spirits being healed and strengthened. Patients re requested us to sing songs to them again and we did and they enjoyed it. We'd have pa we have passed literature to some of the people in Fort Worth. It was challenging because some of them didn't want our literature, but that didn't bring us down. It helped, it encouraged us to keep sharing with more people. And by, and by God's grace, the books that we left with some of them left an impression on their hearts and helped them with their life with God and also possibly share it with other friends and family. But there's still way more work to do. In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 verses 1 and 3, please turn with me there. Just give me an amen when you've got it. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace. From God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So here it's talking about Paul. He's giving some perfect, some good information to Timothy. And at this time, Timothy was a young man and God was impressing Paul to tell him what he should do for the future to come. He told him that he was to be bold and to tell the truth amongst the other doctrines that are being taught where he was. Paul and Timothy were to stand firm for the truth just as we all should do today and now in the end times. False teachings, speculations, and vain discussions prevalent that led to swerving and wondering. These youth were to stand firm and provide the truth for others. So are we, to so are we today to stand true. Please turn with me to Ruth 1 verse 16. And please give me an amen when you've got it. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God be my God. Here we see Ruth as a young widow who chose to stay with her mother-in-law and to be a blessing to her. We also, as the youth of today, are a blessing to our churches in different ways. Jesus was a young person when he discussed and taught in temples. He marveled the people as intelligence and convincing discourses. We can also do the same as youth to many people today. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ladies and gentlemen, sons and daughters of God, we can also do this through God who gives us strength and knowledge through wisdom and intelligence. We can also see these things from our pioneer, Ellen G. White. Her education ended abruptly at nine years old. but By God's grace, she became an author of more than 5,000 articles and 40 books, and her work continues to influence millions of lives today. She accepted the call to be a prophet at age 17. She prayed and discussed and did biblical truths until midnight at times. She did this as a youth, and God can use every single one of us here like he did with Miss Ellen G. White. Our church pioneers and early magazine editors were young people barely out of their teens. Like one man, John Nevins Andrews was an SDA minister, missionary, writer, editor, and scholar. John N. Andrews was the first San Adventist missionary sent to countries outside the U.S. He was a prominent author and scholar of his time in the Adventist church. 
He began working in New England. He played a pivotal role in the establishment of Adventist theology. His achievement in the Adventist church was identifying an Adventist prophetic interpretation, identifying the two-horned beast as the United States. He also helped in the development and organization of the Adventist church. God blessed this man with many talents. God can also do much more with our talents. Each and every one of us are, and each and every single one of us are special. God created us for a purpose, and we should all try to fulfill it. Morning, church. What is our responsibility as the youth in the last days in spreading, what is our responsibility as the youth in spreading the gospel? Daniel's three friends were captured during the fall of Jerusalem and were taken to Babylon. After King Nebuchadnezzar's, of this, king Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue was interpreted by Daniel, the king had a statue, golden statue erected, gold statue of himself built in his honor. The three boys remained faithful to God when all the other people bowed down to King Nebuchadnezzar's statue and are thrown into the fiery furnace, but were spared by God. After a the 90-foot gold statue was built, a command was given that when they hear the, heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and all kinds of other music, they were to bow down and worship the statue. Whoever didn't would be thrown into the blazing furnace. As soon as the music was played, all people, nations, and men of every language worshiped the statue. But the three Hebrew boys did not. The king was filled with rage, and another chance was given to them, but they refused. The furnace was ordered to be heated seven times hotter, and the soldiers were ordered to tie the boys and throw them in. But there are lessons we can gain from this story. The boys declared that they would not serve or worship the image of gold. They would not, they stood for the right principles and truth, even if it meant death. They stood for the living God without shame nor fear. We also have a responsibility and duty to stand for the truth no matter what the cost. Amen. We have to share the light so that others can see, can learn from us just as these youth did. And as adults and members of, uh, adults and members of this church, you have this duty as well. Yes. In today's terms, it means to stand up for God and your beliefs despite what others think and the consequences. And, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers as an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Everyone knows the story of Joseph. He was his father's favorite because he had been born to him in his old age. Because he was Jacob's favorite, he, his 10 older bro brothers despised him. They stripped him of his coat, threw him into a pit, and sold him into slavery. Joseph was taken to Egypt, and when he arrived there, a, a, a officer high in, an officer high in the Egyptian army by the name of Potiphar bought Joseph. Joseph began as a servant in Potiphar's house and quickly gained favor in Potiphar's eye and was soon put in charge of his household. Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce, seduce Joseph, but with firm resolve, he resisted. And in Genesis chapter 39, verse nine, he says to her, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And in Genesis chapter 37, verse two, we find out that Joseph was only 17 years old. This young man in a strange land, alone and separated from his family, remained faithful to his God. Joseph later recognizes that, later recognizes that God used him to serve, save the lives of the Hebrew and Egyptian nation when God helped him to interpret the, seven, the dream of the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. When Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to buy food, he tested and confronted them. But when he revealed himself to them, they were gripped with fear because of his power. But in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 to 20, he says to them, don't be afraid. You intended to harm me, but God intended, to, intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God entrusted a youth to accomplish a vital role to save the lives of many nations. And in today's time, he entrusts and empowers the youth 
to accomplish different types of roles and work in our church, community, and society. But there are distractions that are pointed to them these, to our youth these days. Social media, acceptance, opposite sex, ambitions, and materialism. These five factors can be a modern day golden image because of how we spend our time with them and how attentive we are with them. They can derail our, derail our focus towards God and point us in the wrong direction which can be harmful to us spiritually. Please turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse one. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse one. Please give me an amen when you find it. It says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. In Sons of Daughters of God, page 13, it tells us, amid the perils of these last days, the only safety of the youth lies in ever increasing watchfulness and prayer. The youth who finds joy in reading the word of God and in the hour of prayer will be constantly refreshed by the drafts from the fountain of life. He will attain a height of moral excellence and a breadth of thought for which others cannot conceive. The youth who are weary of the deceptions and distractions in the world and abstain from it and remain loyal to God and study his word will be blessed with wisdom. The youth need to be engaged in God's word and share it with others. They need to pray earnestly and unceasingly. They need to pray for the church and parents for good leadership and mentoring. And in Heavenly Places, page 215, it says, if the counsels of the word of God are faithfully followed, the saving grace of Christ will be brought to our youth, for the children who yield themselves to the molding power of his word are the objects of God's special care and blessing. But the youth have many different types of work they can do for God while waiting for his second coming in last days. For example, Sabbath school, Bible work, canvassing, teaching and witnessing, business, medical work, ministry, foreign missions, and youthful service. Works and services like these can help guide the youth to stay on the right path and bring them closer to God. They can bring, shine, bring a light to other people who are in darkness and bring them closer to God and his grace and mercy. And in Christ Object Lessons, pages 326 and 327, it tells us, each has its place in the eternal plan of heaven each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is a special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. If the youth can be guided and pointed in God's direction, there'll be blessings brought upon them. They should, be, they should also spread the news of God's love and mercy to bring people to him so they can be blessed with his word. Dear Church of God, we have our youth church growing and we have our youth with us today. Let us embrace them and teach them so they can be solid, knowledgeable, and equipped in God's word and mentor them so they can be effective in ministering for God. Our community pre prepare them to carry God's word today and tomorrow. God can use today's youth like he used the other youth in the Bible. May God bless you. Hi. Happy Sabbath. 70% of young adults drop out of church. A research company called Barna Group recently found that less than 1% of the young adult population in the United States has a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview includes believing the Bible is completely inerrant, absolute moral truth exists, that Satan is a real being and not symbolic, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth, that you cannot get into the kingdom of heaven through good works alone, and that God is the supreme creator of the heavens and the earth. 
Think about this for a second. That means that less than 1% of people out there, including Christians, including kids right here in this church, are going to services and attending Vespers, but not believing in the very basic truths. Nearly 75% of Christian young people leave the church after high school. So what's happening in that time period? What is going on that is so life-changing that it causes thousands of young Christians every year to leave the faith? It all boils down to pressure. Senior year is a high-stress red zone for most of us. There are college admissions, SATs, varsity sports, a complete melting pot of good intentions. But most of the time, this becomes overwhelming. We drown ourselves in everything else. That church becomes a thought pushed to the back of the mind. But according to an article on Christianity Today, kids aren't rejecting the church. They aren't leaving it as an act of rebellion. They simply stop seeing it as relevant to their lives. There are four main factors as to why kids are staying in church. Number one, I wanted the church to help guide my decisions in everyday life prior to age 18. So as an adult, you may ask yourself, well, what do teens have to make decisions about? We're paying for college, we're paying for clothes, we're giving them a roof over their head. But it's more than that. Control is huge to a teenager. At a time when everything is changing and decisions about big things like college and car payments are being made, us young people are caught in the threshold of being too young and too old. Sometimes leaving the church can be a decision that seems completely okay at the time. We're too busy with school and David and Goliath just doesn't seem like something we could apply to our daily lives. But what needs to happen is we need to have people explain to us that church is important. God is essential to what we are doing right now. Goliath was a giant, and David was a, small giant, was a small boy who killed a giant with a stone. A stone. I can't even decide on what I want to eat for dinner. But that's the thing. Goliath could be a problem in our lives, a bill we don't think we can pay, a person bringing us down with words and actions, and David is us, small, incompetent, against the world, the stone is God's work through us. By slinging that stone and trusting in God, David killed the giant. Through God's work through young people, we too can slay our giants with a stone. All we need is a little push in the right direction. If you will turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, it tells more of the story of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 32. It says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Even David, whose own brothers didn't understand him, was able to see past the youth label and go on to slay a magnificent giant. So, the second factor of why kids are staying in church is my parents were still married to each other and both attended church prior to age 18. 
In a survey done in 2010, it was said that 45 to 50 percent of marriages end in divorce. Divorce does not just affect the parents' everyday lives, but their kids as well. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 14, it reads, Then some children were brought to him, so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone, and do not hinder them from coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus saw that even as children, we need someone to look up to who's older and more experienced. He allowed the children to sit on his lap and listen to him preach. The disciples wanted to shoo the children, but Jesus embraced them. As much as we hate to admit it as teens, we do need our parents, and we want to make them proud. Growing up around anyone will have you start to imitate them. It's only natural. So seeing our parents go to church on a regular basis and also to enjoy it is huge. Because it's like watching someone eat ice cream or try a new sport. You, you have to try it. Here's a quick story. When I was around three or four, my mom and dad and I were in the car on our way home. My parents were still dating. I was very talkative when I was younger, always singing and laughing. Well, I might have dropped a toy on the floor and let a few bad words slip, much to the shock of my parents. Of course, my dad thought it was hilarious, though my mom was not impressed. But they realized that even if they hadn't noticed, I had been watching them and absorbing everything they did or said around me. They started to understand that they had to be careful about what went on when I was around because there's such a constant in my life that I had begun to imitate them. So the second factor is that the parents were married and attended church. The third factor of why kids stay in church is the pastor's sermons were relevant to my life. I touched on this a bit with David and Goliath, but to elaborate a little more, relevance is huge. If relevance was a band, it'd be selling out Madison Square Garden in a snap. We'd wear ironic band tees and make signs with glitter pins because relevance is to teens as haystacks is to Adventists. <laughs> we need to feel connected to what we're learning. Otherwise, it seems pointless. Without being able to apply what we get out of church to our daily lives, it becomes just another story, just another sermon to listen to for half an hour and then go home. The final factor of why kids stay in church is at least one adult from church made a significant investment in me personally and spiritually between the ages of 15 and 18. The youth can't do this alone. We might think we can, but we really can't. Turns out we need help. Being led by older people in this church in our walk with God is major. It helps us see that we're not alone. We don't have to answer all of big, life's big questions without help. If you see one of us, talk to us. I promise we don't bite. Say hello and ask us how we think the sermon went, what our thoughts were on the topics discussed, what we learned in Sabbath school. We really do listen, and we like to be heard in return. So that was four factors of why teens do stay in the church. If you remember from earlier, I said that 70% of young people drop out of church. But what I didn't mention was that two-thirds of them usually end up coming back. We are not lost causes. Sometimes we're just lost. A problem faced by an alarming rate of teens today is mental disease. Here are some startling statistics. One in 10 children and young people aged 5 to 16 suffer from a diagnosable mental health disorder. That's around three children in every class. Between one in every 12 and one in 15 children and young people deliberately self-harm. And nearly 80,000 suffer from severe depression. The number of young people aged 15 to 16 with depression nearly doubled between the 1980s and the 2000s. In the last few years, mental disorders such as anxiety, depression, anorexia, and bulimia have skyrocketed among the youth. Many are turning to self-harm or self-medication and turning their backs on religion and parents. They feel lost and alone, like there is no one around to help them. 
When the word depression runs through your mind, what reasoning do you see? Troubles in family? Issues with friends? All those are contributing factors. However, there are more that are just not recognized. When a youth is depressed, more than likely they feel out of control of their own life. They feel as if their op opinions and thoughts don't matter, and more importantly, that no one cares. So to release all the tension, anger, and anxiety, they turn to self-harm. But let me say, it is not a cry for attention, friends. It's a cry for help. It allows them to feel in control of their body. It leaves scars on their skin showing their pain. They wear, they wear these to get sympathy, to hopefully catch the attention of someone who cares, someone who will listen. The youth today are messed up. There are so many problems we face, such as mental disorders, peer pressure, and the constant attention to social media. But just as it was said in Alice in Wonderland, I say it now. We're all mad here. The youth's position in the end times is simple, to listen. That may not seem like much to you, but it's all we ever want. We want to be heard. We want to be respected for what we say, how we feel. We just want to communicate. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, I'll continue on. Matthew 24, verse 7. It says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. It already says that people will be turning against each other. We don't need another wedge between us. We need to band together, the young and the older, to bring God's word to all the people out there who have never even heard his name. Amen. Youth and the end days. It seems like such a faraway concept. No one knows when Jesus is coming. We don't have a day to mark on our calendars. We just have each other and the Bible. But the fact that we don't know when it's going to happen is the very reason why we need to stick together. The youth's purpose in the end times is to band the people of the world together so we can all meet Jesus someday. Here's how we can keep the youth in the church so they can fulfill that calling. Get us involved. Start doing youth hikes, youth Bible studies, and youth movie nights. Help us want to know God. Listen, we are sort of interesting if you talk to us, and we certainly like to talk. Realize that today's teen problems are both different and the same to when you were a teen. Some things have changed, some things have stayed the same, Find common ground. We are all going on the same journey to worship God. Finally, we want to be equipped and not entertained. We want to be able, able to fight our religion in a courtroom and win. We want to be able to confidently talk about God and blow any offending question out of the water. Yeah, we like to have fun, but we also want to be secure in our beliefs. The youth are the future, sure but we are also just the youth. We still need guidance. And I think I speak for all of us when I say we're ready to listen. We're ready to be a part of God's army. How about you? Amen.